Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Village Global Venture Stories. I'm here today joined by a very special guest, Chris Kastig. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Hey Eric, how's it going? So Chris, you have a, an eclectic set of experiences. You, you are the co-founder of OneMonth.com, where people learn how, how to code HTML, JavaScript, et cetera, in 30 days or less. You're the host of the Learn to Code podcast. You're an adjunct professor at Columbia University, where you teach digital literacy for decision makers. Uh, you have an MA in New Media from University of Amsterdam. And, and now you're working on a, a book, the, the Untold History of the, of the Internet. What's the why now behind this book in terms of you know, 2020 and where we're at, but also in terms of your experiences and, and what threads you kept pulling that have led you to this point? Yeah, big question. I love it. <laughs> I, uh, I've just been fascinated by the, the how we got here moment of the Internet. And it just the how every moment for the past 20 years that I've been kind of immersed in Internet history and, and coding... Uh, I feel like it just keeps getting more and more interesting. But then, there, you know, there's this moment, I think, that we all had in 2016, I will say, when a lot of things, it was really clear that a lot of things went wrong with the internet. And I would say that was the Russian interference in the elections, uh, a few different things, anything from email leaks, from the Podesta emails, to propaganda and disinformation. Um, a lot of this is public. We know a lot about this now. And I think we're we're now in the ashes trying to ask questions, where do we go from here? And there's a lot of opinions. And the thing I'm that I'm interested in, in sharing and that I think we actually need is a story unifying how we got here. And the story doesn't begin with Steve Jobs. <laughs> right. The story goes before Steve Jobs. And uh, and that's kind of what what I really finds fascinating. I find the more, you know, so I'm just making, making light of the fact that I think a lot of the hero stories we tell kind of start in the mid nineties. Um, but I think that there's lots of mythology, like in a, in a positive kind of like, this is where we came from kind of way. These are the lessons we've learned in the past that we can learn from the future. And I'd say that that's just been really, really fascinating to me. And that's what I've been uh, researching and writing about. Yeah. So l- let's get into it. You, you separate sort of the, the history of the internet into uh, a few different acts. Why don't you give some of the, some of the background in terms of how you've uh, h- how you've segmented it? Yeah, I see there being three acts. There is what I'm calling the myth of cyberspace. So that would be the first act. The second act being big tech. That being anything from um, the startup boom to you know what is kind of now somewhat pejoratively called big tech, which is you know Facebook and Amazon and Google, this whole thing. Um, and then there's the the one that's still being written, which I'm calling the new internet. You know, I think very few people would look at the internet now and say, "Hey, everything this is great." Like, <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe a few people at the top would. I, I don't even think that's true. But I do think that there is a lot of need for reform. So the third act being the new internet, you know, where do we go from here? And there's, I mean, it's such a cool time. There's so much going on with with the ways that things could go. And so I break that up between cyberspace, you know, the original intention, big tech, which exemplified a lot of the problems and faults, which is where we are now, and then looking forward to the new internet. So let's go deep on, on act one. Uh, how, how did the internet come to be? Who, who gets credit? You know, I know it's not, not only is it not Steve Jobs, I know it's not Al Gore. How, how should we think about how this came to be and, and any sort of lessons or, or what's important to know about it? So, yeah, Eric, uh, I, yeah, I'd be curious, like, let's, let's chat this out because, um, sure. yeah, I'd be curious kind of, kind of where you're coming from and what you know, but I'll, I'll start the story off. You know, the internet, you know, originally started, it was an American invention. The American government created it back in the 60s. And really the moment of inception of this project came right after 1957, when you've probably heard of this, there was a beeping sound going around the orbit of the planet up in the sky, like beep, 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 beep. Um, This was Sputnik that the Russians had launched up in the sky, a satellite which had was circling around. And it actually, it would pass over. I mean, this is beyond my time, but you know, you can see online, it would pass over New York, it would pass over Pennsylvania, it would pass, you know, we could see it from the sky. And there was this sense in the United States that we are losing to the Russians. This was the middle of the Cold War. 
And there was really two stories in the world. There, you know, two prevailing stories. There was communism, which the Russians um, had had taken after the fall of World War II. And then there was the Americans. And we were really proudly looking forward to democracy and um, and kind of liberal ideals. And we took that, we looked at that fear. There was a lot of fear, a lot of paranoia that this, this thing was going to drop bombs on us, that it had the potential, if they could be in the skies, what's next kind of thing. And so Eisenhower, the president at the time, funded two programs in order to really kind of pull America, you know, pull our pants up tight and, and get and get in the fight to show that we had, that we could do it, that we could fight, that we could win. Uh, and the two programs, one which everyone's familiar with is NASA, so the space race. And the second program, which also got military funding, would be ARPA, which I'll say is the cyberspace race, um, the technology. And that would be over the next decade where the internet was born. Yeah. And I, one of the um, you know, more striking things about that to me, that story to me is just that people don't appreciate how competent our government was. Yeah. Tell me more. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just how critical it was to, to innovation. And it seems that over time, you know, a lot of that sort of innovation that we used to depend on the government for has, has become privatized or, you know, and, you know, uh, Elon and, and SpaceX, but, you know, uh, Andrew and, and some of the military stuff, like it just seems. Um, and I, I don't know whether to lament that or whether to celebrate that because sort of things that are, that are private tend to be you know more efficient or more, more better aligned. Do you, do you have a take on how that transformation came to, to happen and any take on whether, uh, you know, uh, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, the, the, the privatization of, of tech, I, you know, uh, yeah, of government, uh, yeah. of government. I, I can really only kind of look back uh, with the appreciation for what the public spending, you know, because our tax dollars went to fuel that and pulling together some of the, the most important minds at the time. Like, I think there's just, I think just having a, an appreciation of that it's hard for me to kind of speak with it about it without kind of bringing in politics because, you know, there is this kind of laissez-faire, more Republican ideal of let the markets figure it out. Everything should be privatized. What good has the public good ever done for us? Uh, the post office. Oh, the post office is failing. But, you know, yeah, the, I think recognizing that the Internet, you know, came from this publicly funded um, this program. So I, I think acknowledging it is is an important first step. Uh, I don't know. You know, I don't know if I could really speak to what you know, what, what they would be doing. Yeah. Like the future of that as, as far as, as where we go from there. Totally. You know, it's interesting because it had very, you know, decentralized roots philosophically. Um, and there's just sort of been the seesaw between decentralization and centralization, but actually I'm, I'm not as knowledgeable about the roots. I mean, I know there's John Perry Barlow and I'll, I know the cyberpunks, et cetera. Talk yeah. a little bit about sort of how the ethos of decentralization came into sort of the, the rise of the internet and then let's get into how that changed. Yeah, well, I mean, the the story is fascinating. So it has to do with this fear that we had that really Russia was going <laughs> to drop bombs on us. And you know, there's there's a whole you know there's, there's a whole kind of perspective from real events that were going on. You know, in the '60s, everything from Cuba having you know pointing missiles to us and Cuban Missile Crisis and Russians and uh, you know all these conversations that were going on, you know, politically, but kind of like behind the scenes, there were these nerds, <laughs> more or less, that were, I mean, lovely, lovely nerds, like, you know, like, that are very inspiring to me, who, who were looking at this from, you know, how can we improve our technology as a weapon or as a tool to protect the American people? And what, there was one guy in particular named Paul Barron, and he really he did something that's really famous today that you get seen shared a lot, and I don't think he usually gets credited for it. But he came up with the original diagrams for decentralization and, and distributed networks, and they're all over the internet. You see them. I mean, I think if you're in the in the crypto space or in in this kind of space, you see the same copy from what he published in 1964 in his government you know, doc documentation and research, um, which is this, these three, these three diagrams, one being centralization, which is a point in the middle. And you can imagine like a star kind of an always kind of everything's coming out of this one point, one being decentralization. And that's, there's multiple points and multiple stars and connections. So one's being distributed, which is more like a net, you could like an actual, like an actual net you might like, uh, throw over 
a chicken. I don't know. I'm not sure whether you would imagine like a net you catch something with, um, where basically all of the, all of the points of contact are equally. If you cut one, uh, webbing of it, you didn't really ruin the net. That's the idea. So he, he came up with these three ideas really to, as a way to, it's not directly said in the document that, that the reason he did it was because of a fear that there would be military attacks, uh, in America, but in if you kind of follow the conversations there are you know at the top there there was this fear that we could be bombed and so the idea was if we have a centralized communication network which is what we had right think about centralized like if you were to bomb the one AT&T building that has all of the communications then all of New York's communications are going to go down. So this was the fear. So this is more or less what the document showed in really technical terms and he was like well there's different ways that we could design communication systems and he presented this idea of, of decentralization. It's not like he invented the word, but he he just presented the idea of, from a technical aspect of ways of routing signal. And that's what it was in the doc. So that was kind of one of the first really famous um, proposals for this. And, and what would then get over the next few years coded into what would become the ARPANET. Totally. And, and so there was sort of this uh, it's very ethos of decentralization and people built, you know, pro- decentralized products like, like Napster. And, and then there was this sort of say, Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, sort of attack on decentralization. Was this from the same people that were celebrating it previously or were a bunch of people you know, unaware of the celebrations or not celebrating it? Or was it, was, yeah, was it from the same people who were celebrating it? But once they realized that it attacks their business models, uh, they said, Oh, th- this is no longer fit. T- talk a little bit about that, that transition yeah. of how that attack came out. Yeah, that, this is really interesting. So when you said there was an attack on decentralization, I, I have an idea of, of what you're talking about. Can you can you just elaborate a little more, maybe an example or, or pull that apart a little more? Like in terms of Napster and the music industry, I think people were just sort of upset that, oh, now artists would not be paid and it was no longer fair and you create sort of these, these black markets and that there wouldn't be accountability and you sort of change markets in a way that, that made things worse. And you, you'd worry about maybe accountability or, or, or transparency or, or, um, or, or, or things of, of that nature. Yeah. Um, yeah, this, this is fascinating and there's a lot to unpack there. I, I would, you know, the, the first thing that comes to mind is that there's a real tension. Uh, there's actually uh, one of my heroes, uh, Stuart Brand, who is a real pioneer of the cyberspace age and a lot of the early tech in Silicon Valley and just like inspiration to so many. He, back in the day, he had said, information wants to be free. And this got, this gets quoted a lot. Information wants to be free. Um, have you heard that before, Eric? Yeah, yeah, of course. There, Aaron Schwartz and uh, but yeah, before that. Yeah, quick, Aaron yeah. Schwartz. Yeah. Exactly right. Exactly. Right. Um, so the, the thing is like, there's actually, there's actually a little more to that quote that gets left off and it's information wants to be free but it also wants to be valuable. And so the two, this this kind of wanting of information to be out of control and for it wanting to be free and also uh, wanting to capture that value, uh, there's a tension, there's, there, there are odds often. And I don't, yeah, I don't know if there's an, a nervous, oversimplified way to explain. I mean, I think the RIA thing in Napster is super interesting because that's, that's how I got into it, which is I was a music major in around 2001 and I was working at a, rec- a record. What do you call it? <laughs> you even called it. It's been so long. Uh, I recorded a record label um, back in 2001 and I was, you know, I was able to kind of see, Oh, this Napster, you know, at my college campus at the time was like, you can just get music for free. Like, how is this possible? Right. So there was, there was a big tension, I think, because you have two, you have two different players that you have the the musicians, which, a lot of the musicians that I knew who were, you know, up and coming, like myself, I, I was in a band and I had music, like to me to be able to share the music and to make it free was so liberating. Right. And it was like freedom. And then the other side of the, I would say the same side of the other coin is, you know, but you need the labels, you need the control, you need the distribution models to sell it. And that system basically fell apart because it, it was, it was predicated on, you know, a 20th century a 20th century business model that, that really just needed retrofitting. And, and that, that kind of unbundling as it's called is really the, you know, is really the kind of um, the narrative that, that would then befall so many different other industries as we, as we know now. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, Mark Andreessen, I think quoting Jim Barksdale said that, you know, two ways to uh, make money into you know, unbundling and, and bundling and sort of this centralizing and decentralizing. And, and so let's talk about the transition 
from you know this, this decentralized internet to uh, to big tech um, and and how mm. that wasn't sort of the, the plan or it wasn't expected. When, when Mark Andreessen is asked about it, I think in interviews he said something along the lines of, "If we had figured out identity and money, that that might have helped uh, help, helped solve uh, some of it." What's your take as to why you know we had such such centralization and is, is there anything that could have been done to prevent it? Yeah, um, it's that's a great. Yeah, he, that is true. He he did say that. He had said something like the original sin of the internet was advertising and that it stems from the idea that we weren't able to transfer money in the early internet uh in the in the early browser and in in some respects that's well that's kind of what what bitcoin has become but you know it's still something we're working on as far as like uh well i'm getting i'm getting a little ahead of ourselves but going back going back to like not that not being able to do there is where advertising um he points to advertising as one of the flaws in the internet so what does that transition look like? You know, I, I mean, there's like a plus and a minus to all of this. I, you know, I think um, I'm most interested in kind of learning the lessons from from what happens. And uh, and I think what le- one lesson is, you know, we we did like the internet did need money as far as as far as investment and capital and business to to come on to the web in the 90s in order to legitimize it. There's a moment in 1991, 1991, so many things happened. It, it happens to be the year that the the web, the first version of the web is released. And it also happens to be the year that Vint Cerf, who is the one of the co-founders of the TCP IP original internet back at ARPANET, in 1991, him and Al Gore come together and they pass what is what is kind of known as the, the Gore Bill which for the first time allows commercial properties, commercial money to flow through the webs of the internet. Because if you remember before that, the internet was mostly used for government and and academia. It was in colleges and colleges and this kind of thing for research and all that kind of stuff. So, so when in the, you know, in 1991, at that moment when they decide, okay, you know, we're going to let MCI, we're going to let all these early companies come on and and use this space i think i think the analogy back then would be like the fcc in the radio and television world would like allocate space for certain players you know it was very regulated of communications um we take that for granted now but they were basically like okay we're gonna we're gonna open up this space for for commercial you know at the time when that happened like one of the main reasons why when vince surf who was a you know was and is a huge proponent of decentralization and um, free and open internet and all of these kind of, you know, somewhat radical, radical ideas in terms of like, it's out of control. And the, you know, in terms of your RIAA Napster example, like, you know, th- there is a freedom and a, and, a, and a liberty of the internet that's really, that's really beautiful. But the reason that like, he, you know, who created the internet and he, and he was really part of that was so vocal and such a proponent of it was because back then the internet was, was like the wild, wild west. It was, nobody trusted it. I mean, it would probably be like Bitcoin in 2013 or something. People kind of maybe laughed at it, you know, and it needed the government's backing. It needed more of a backbone to, in order to become mainstream, or at least that was the hypothesis. And, you know, we can say that that's what happens more or less. So, so I think there was like a necessity of the money to come on. And, and then I would say once, once the companies came on, you know, you, they were just driving on the same, same more or less protocols that had been present: the TCP/IP protocol and then the new HTTP protocol. So these are just basically saying the internet, and I'm using acronyms for saying the internet and the web. Over you know over that time, like they haven't really updated since today. They still haven't really updated that much since then. So I think people just kind of use use the environment they're given, and and that's you know that's kind of how this played out. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. I mean, it, Ben Thompson sort of aggregator aggregation theory is sort of this into you know, the study basically of how how big tech came, you know, came to be and why that's different from the business models. Well, the business models of big tech were different from the ones before it, and partially is that it's it's driven around uh, owning demand instead of owning exclusive supply. And what the internet did is sort of made supply uh, infinite, and so the scarcity is really around demand. But what it also enabled is that. Like once you aggregate demand over a critical part of sort of internet real estate, whether it's, you know, social media profiles, uh, you know, resumes, 
you know, actual real estate, whether it's Airbnb or Zillow, travel information or any sort of like really valuable information, you aggregate dem- demand around it. Uh, you use that demand to get better information and you create these sort of data network effects that are just really difficult to, to compete with. Albert Wegner from USV has talked about, I don't know the exact mechanism, whether it's having your own personal API key or, or something where that enables you to transpose the, the data, uh, remove the data that you have you know, in Facebook or in Airbnb or in wherever that is locked up there in a silo to other platforms such that users aren't so dependent on, on these platforms and thus there could be more, more competition. Uh, and, and crypto sort of a potential way to enable that regulation is a way to enable that. Is there anything that could have been done in sort of the you know, early internet that could have been uh, built into it such that these data network effects wouldn't become so effectively monopolistic not not or olig- oligopolistic not in the same way that the monopolies of, of, of before where it was around supply but where it's now around you know user attention yeah that's really interesting um i don't yeah i don't know that i have the answer as far as like what could have happened you know um i don't know yeah because i you know i rode i rode a lot of i mean i was a developer for you know about 15 years so through a lot of this and it's funny because like in hindsight I think I see things different than when I did at the time. Like I, you know, I think that, and that speaks to like, you know, in my heart, I'm an optimist and I believe that people have the best intentions. And, you know, when like AWS started, you know, you could do cloud computing or setting up your own API. Like a a lot of these consolidations of data were just like fascinating. You know, I mean, I remember I I had a startup back in 2011 where I was uh, scraping friends of friends data on Facebook and making like a friends of friends API that you could query. It it seemed innocent at the time because it was just fascinating of like, look what you can do, you know. But, uh, you know, I think that power unchecked over scale, you know, there's we had, we weren't really thinking so, so deeply about it. I would say uh, in a lot of the the projects that I was working on, it was just kind of like trying to push the limits. And I think there's a beauty to that. And I think we crossed the line though, in, in what we could create such that I think now we're seeing a lot of those ramifications, you know? So I, I don't know what could have, like what could have been different. I mean, I think that there's like, we could say, we could kind of say this could have been different. This could have been different. And surely there's been, you know, the EFF and lots of privacy advocates and um, cypherpunks and like people have been trying to improve the internet. I mean, this is nothing new, you know, I think by no means is this like a new cause. This is, this has been going on since the, the early internet, which I think is even part of, you know, one of the things I'm writing about in the book, which I think is fascinating, which is like, this is something that's been going on. And like, how do we take all of these, these kind of different threads of people showing up in the story, looking at. I would say the protocols, which is the underlying code versus reforming, which is top down. Okay. We're going to try to make Facebook. We're going to try to prove Facebook versus bottom up. We're going to try to improve the code. You know, I think these, this tension has been, has been playing out for decades now. And um, I think we're just starting to kind of really kind of more mainstream, have a lot of these conversations. And, and what are the lessons for how we've handled it in the past uh, and and in terms of w- what we do going forward, you know, I think around Microsoft, there was this idea, like basically, you know, there's all confirmation bias everywhere. There's this idea that, you know, regulation threats and actual regulation around Microsoft is what disrupted a monopoly. Other, you know, technologists think that actually it had nothing to do with that. And it was just mobile, you know, just increased innovation. What is your take on sort of the top, the tops down versus bottoms up uh, approach in terms of what's worked and what we learn from either other approaches in practice? Yeah, I think I think what you're referring to is uh, is it the anti are you talking about the antitrust uh, yes, yes, yes. against Microsoft yep. in the nineties? Yeah. When they were bundling together Internet Explorer, the browser, the dead browser now, into their <laughs> operating system, which really kind of destroyed competition, which was also an exciting time as a developer because at making websites and apps for the nine, you know, late nineties, when I started, uh, into the two thousands, there was multiple browsers, you know, and, and in some ways they had different experiences and we forget that mostly because people just had one browser they used, but from the developer standpoint, you know, I would have to code different versions of different websites, different kinds of access, different, you know, small adjustments to the different browsers. And I think, you know, one of the lessons from that is we're seeing that, again now there's a sense of wild wild westness popping up again and there are now different 
access points because we haven't aligned on what the next the next step is going to look like. I mean, there's you know, for example, there's uh, the Blockstack browser, which is a, a company that I think uh, Albert Wenger is uh, a supporter or investor in, and uh, you mentioned him. and uh, And the Blockstack browser is great; it allows you to to go on and see new apps, right? Like we have Gmail, right, which is Google's you know, uh, mail servers. But if you were to go through this different browser now, there's apps being coded that you can't get on the original, you know, on our normal browser and they have D-mail. So it's decentralized mail as an example, right? And it uses different protocols that have built into them different kinds of thinking, different kinds of ideologies, more centered around, I would say, human rights, human liberty. I mean, as far as guaranteeing certain levels of privacy, privacy that we haven't been able to guarantee on our TCP IP, which is the current internet, right? So I think the lessons from the past are like, there are so many different, <laughs> there's a there's a time when there's many forks in the road. And I think we have been there and somebody's going to get to decide. And we're at that point again, or it may even be just a little too early, but we are about to approach that in the next few years um, in a more mainstream way. We're going to have these different forks in the road, these different options and politics top down is going is always going to kind of <laughs> kind of and by top down i mean re- regulation you know regulation is it's already coming it's already here in many ways um in the crypto space you can say um around the internet net neutrality like th- there's always kind of this this kind of top and down thing it's a bit of an oversimplification but i, th- I to me i think a, a lot of the the top down tends to be short term solutions and the bottom up tends to be more long term solutions that would kind of be one way i think of it totally so we talked about transition from the you know the first act to, to, to the second act of big tech, and we're talking about some of the reasons why we're you know needing a transition again. These, these players are too big. You know the internet is controlled by you know more or less just a f- just a few players. These are it seems sort of indestructible, and and um, there's some externalities. Well, while they provide excellent services, there's some externalities that have come as as a result of that. And let's get into the third act a bit. When you when when you think about that what comes to mind for you and where are we, what's most exciting? Uh, how do you make sense of it? Yeah. So, you know, when I, when I look at the ways forward, I, I boil down four different characteristics that are missing from the current internet and specifically from the protocol, which is what is running the internet, right? The TCP IP, HTTP um, internet that we have, right? Uh, and so what I mean by that is, is there's four things that I think a lot of the solutions center around and I think are really worth looking into. And the four would be uh, number one, identity, which we've touched on. Number two, trust. Number three, data privacy. And number four, tools around censorship. And all four of these were never... You know, I would say the original intention of the original internet was data liberation. It was all about making data resilient, uh, in theory, to go around cent- uh, to damage, to go around damage. To you know, this this kind of metaphor I showed you about the uh, well, it wasn't a metaphor, but it was the idea that that we could be bombed at any point, like it could happen, right? So we need to have our, our information be free, resilient. But in that, we left out certain things, and those things: identity, trust, data privacy, and censorship are the things that were left out are not only the things that we need to improve, but they're the four things that big tech has capitalized on over the past two decades. Like the ability, because we don't have a certain level of data privacy, Facebook is able to operate in a way that they can scrape all your data and centralize and store it. You don't have that right. They have it, right? Um, And the same thing with censorship, because there isn't a fully censorship resistant protocol or protection with the way the current internet works, you know, you, you probably know this, but your IP address for is, is just one example of many would be your IP address. When you log on, it's public, right? Everything you're leaving your fingerprint all over the internet as to where your computer is, right? Mine right now would say I'm in Brooklyn and I go all over the internet. Every site is capturing that if they want to. And, and you know, the government could be looking at that, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just one example of this structure coded into the code uh, is what becomes a limitation to our rights of our, our right of free speech in a way, you know, to, to be censored. It's easy to censor somebody based on their location. We see that a lot in, in other countries outside of the United States. So we take it for granted here, but these four things I would say 
are really kind of the crux of, of what we should be focusing on and also, you know, what a lot of companies are, are centering around moving forward. And what, what's sort of the relative status of, of those four things in terms of how advanced or not advanced are we at, at addressing them? I mean, I think that there's, there's like hacks, you know, and like if you're kind of knowledgeable, you can, you can kind of start to get around some of the stuff like censorship, for example. I mean, you know, a VPN solves a lot of that problem, a lot of these problems, obfuscating where you're coming from, you know, uh, data privacy. I think that there's, there's some ways to get around that. I mean, maybe just like being smart enough not to use certain sites or to use certain protections, but I think, I think that there's like a really bright future coming. And I, I think this is really the story of the new protocols, which, you know, that we, we tend to refer to as blockchain and cryptocurrency. And in this new space is people from the bottom up who are really recoding the internet. I guess one of the things that kind of, you know, is like a <laughs> pet peeve or like, you know, itches me a little bit is um, pet peeve is probably not the right word, but just something that like I see and I feel like it's incomplete is speaking of blockchain, like it's some totally new savior of the world kind of happening 10 feet over here to the right. When actually what we're really talking about are the problems with our current protocols, which is our current internet and new protocols that address that. I mean, it's a lot less sexy of a way to think that, but it, there is there is like a real reason why we need these things. And I think there's a real kind of patch and way forward that this, um, you know, that this, there's a larger narrative, which I, th- I find really inspiring. Yeah. So I, I want to sort of um, bring up a, a narrative that some of the way I've sort of made sense around sort of the, the, yeah, I'd love to hear. the, the rise and fall of big tech and sort of a public eye. And it's, it's only partially what I, what I believe, but it, it's a little bit, it, a little bit on, on the nose uh, politically. So my sort of two, two senses. Uh, so basically, you know, technology over the last, you know, in sort of the early 2000s, was immensely popular with sort of the elites and institution, you know, the Arab Spring, and it helped get Obama elected. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Silicon Valley folks were were loved by the left. And I, my understanding in journalists and stuff like that, and my understanding is that, you know, startup culture became sort of a self-confident ideological movement, which created a ton of wealth and led to you know, things like Y Combinator, the, the social network, and 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 so on. And, and, and it was sort of a, the, the bad guy then was sort of the Steve Ballmer, Microsoft, anti-open source you know, uh, community. And at the time, most yeah. of tech's opponents were on the, I would say, broad implicit right, you know, Republicans, mega corporations, military dictators that Twitter overthrew. And so like, like Netflix did to the studios at first, Silicon Valley helped the left, I had helped Obama, and then it led to the Arab Spring. But then after Jobs' death in 2011, and Obama's election in 2012, other parts of the Democratic Party started to look at tech, not just as a source of, you know, capital and talent, but as a possible threat. Uh, I, I think they were sort of seen as outliving their usefulness and overstaying their, their welcome, you know, sort of uh, Netflix was a threat to entertainment studios, you know, uh, MOOCs were, you know, a threat to Harvard sort of Buzzfeed was, you know, new media companies were a threat to New York times and stuff like that, or, or at least the long tail of e- East coast media. And so I sort of see it like tech had gone so far left. It had uh, ended up on the right, uh, you know, sort of crude analogy is China and Russia did this, but in a different way, they went so far, uh, left with communism, they ended up on the nationalist right. And so the, in sort of conclusion, tech stopped becoming beloved to the left and started threatening their existence because it attacked their sort of power centers, the New York Times, Hollywood, academia, but then also just undercut prestige and influence, uh, you know, yeah. fake, fake news, et cetera. And so, so this idea that I think we do have new overlords for sure, but I think that obfuscates, like what's actually happened is that the public, sort of this book, The Revolt of the Public, they into it. The public has been given a voice and a lot of what the public has said is fuck you <laughs> to sort of these like big decentralized sort of institutions that, it, you know, government, Hollywood, uh, academia, just institutions all, all across the board. And so when they mean by threat to democracy, it's sort of like Napster in the, in the industries. It's like a threat to how, how they work, which is Harvard does a study, New York Times reports it, g- government en- enacts it, like software is eaten too much. And so I, I say this all to say that will create a new internet, will improve on where the internet has, has not achieved its goals. I just don't necessarily think a lot of people are going to like it. <laughs> like, it, it, like I, don't, I don't necessarily see it as the, as the rise of, of sort of a centralized democracy. Maybe it's a truly decentralized democracy, but it, it's a lot more chaos in a, in a lot of different scenarios. And, it, it, and the, the things that people are concerned about with, with Facebook or otherwise, like I don't think that they're going, like the move from subscription to ad base, I don't think is going to lead to necessarily less 
sort of chaos in our public square, just, just as an example. I'll sort of pause there. I've been rambling for a bit. Any, any no, no, that's yeah. good. Yeah. What do you, and what do you mean? Just that last part, what subscription to ad base? Uh, oh yeah. So people, people have been saying that the, the problem with our, you know, sort of conversation online is that because it's ad based that people are chasing clicks. And so you don't really, you know, it's sort of the junk food over the, you know, and people, uh, are, yeah. people aren't going to pay for that. They're, they want to pay for something that's valuable. But um, in fact, I think what's happening in New York Times is, is subscription. I think is more polarized than ever is, is you, you just start catering to people who um, you, you, now you cater to your customers and your customers tend to, you know, fragment to, to one political side. And thus, you can't even claim to ap- appeal to everybody. When it's ad- ad-based, you were trying to serve everybody. Now you're trying to solve, serve just your customers, and your you know customers are gonna you know want tend to read the things that you know confirm their existing biases, and so you're gonna have even more sort of polarization or fragmentation, possibly at least the media ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think you know in some way, and in some ways, the way you're describing subscriptions and, and, that, and that we're thinking about it. And, and I've heard you, you talk on your podcast about it, you know, before it's with other guests as well. Um, Cause it's definitely, it's definitely a trend I would say. And it, and it seems positive in one light for sure. And it reminds me of kind of just 20th century media. You know, there was certain hubs that you would go to and you would rely on them for a certain voice. And in the past, you know, during most of the 1900s, there was just a few voices, four or five voices that we would look to and, we didn't have so much sown division between us because kind of what ABC was reporting was more or less the same what NBC was reporting. It wasn't, you know, they weren't arguing against each other. One wasn't purporting that certain facts were facts. And, you know, and we see that now because, you know, to go to your subscription model or where, where we are now, there's lots of little hubs, right? And anyone can kind of be a beacon of with quotes around the truth, you know? I think that there is, you know, in some ways there are going to be these little siloed groups that will be more political than the last century. You can have your bias, you know, I mean, again, that has also existed. Um, You know, there's there's always been propaganda newspapers and, you know, as far back as the 1800s um, in this country. But one of the things that's different and that I think is worth appreciating is the spillover of influence and outside influence that really is hacking our decision making and i think the one way i think about that is the uh, the recommendation engine which a lot of people recently have been doing some really good reporting on there was um rabbit hole which is a, a podcast by the new york times they really looked into that and i know tristan harris has, has looked into that a bunch as well uh into this idea of the recommendation engine muddying the ways that we find truth, that we find information. So that if I'm on Facebook, you know, and I and I were to spend a little time on, let's say, a Q post, right? For example, all of a sudden the next day, I can be getting all different invites and groups or uh, on, on YouTube, for example, you know, this own kind of reality that pulls you in and is able to kind of really kind of contort your reality. I was I was shocked to find out that, 70% of the YouTube views, like of all the YouTube views are from people watching recommend, recommended videos, right? So people come on, they go to watch something that someone sent them and that they're looking for. But then the next step after that is really the algorithm that's suggesting you something. And I would say this in the new internet, the ability to lessen that is really important, a really important step forward. And because that is predicated on the centralization of your data that where they can see so much about you and make predictive algorithms as to what you're going to want, what you're going to like, and our, our inability to shut that off or to really have control over that. So I think the subscription model does, while it will, you know, while it will make little bubbles, I think it will slow their growth down. And I think we really need a, sl- a slower internet, <laughs> so to speak, because it's too fast right now. Something happens and it goes it spreads very quickly it gets lots of likes and retweets and attention nearly overnight because there's very few kind of checks and balances or ways that we can stop it it just kind of happens automatically but if we were to kind of pull away that centralization it would still develop but i think a lot less slowly and we might have more clarity as we did you know a hundred years ago when um when we had more space in between our news totally 
I'm curious if you could wave a wand and change anything. We talked a little bit about you know the bottoms up, but but also tops down of, of how you think the internet should be reformed. You mentioned the, the, four, the four things. Uh, how do you think it should be regulated? T- talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the, I mean the main thing, like one of the things that really is, I'd say, really insidious at this moment, especially as we approach another election, is really the anonymity on certain social networks. The anonymity that allows fake accounts to be spun up like tens of thousands um, and purport to be certain players. Um, you know, we saw this a lot in the 2016 election and we're seeing a, a lot now. I'm not like a purist that I think all anonymity is bad and everything. I don't think that's also the answer, but I do think like a, a quick thing, a thing that Facebook or Twitter could do right now would be to to have some better checks. And I think, you know, they are working on it. Um, you know, the res- respective CEOs have blogged and talked about it, but it still seems to be a problem. So I'd say that that seems to me be like a, a quick fix that, that I would like to say. And going deeper on your idea of so slowing the internet down, is, is there a way to do that in the code or, or, or what, um, is that, does it have to come from top down if that's a goal? Yeah. I mean, for sure. You know, I mean, look at, look at the speed of which a retweet is a tweet is retweeted, right? Um, when it is tweeted, if it was tweeted right now, it just gets broadcast to so many different platforms. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what, uh, if I could, you know, express exactly how it happens, but definitely with the code, there's a, there's a few different options, I would say. So we have options for different ways of, of slowing it down, whether it's delaying a little bit before it were to be seen by certain people, or maybe removing the retweet button altogether, or kind of updating it or retrofitting it in certain ways that's more responsible. Or maybe after you retweet, there's like a 10 minute period. I mean, even just, I think any kind of delay to just kind of slow it down and let, and let people (laughs) think for a second (laughs) and reflect possibly. It just, yeah, the, the kind of snowballing of it it seems to be um, impossibly um, insidious, but yeah, that's definitely something that you could do in the code overnight for sure. Yeah. It's It's interesting. Yeah, I, I think my just my sort of broader point is like a, a more truly decentralized internet. Like I think there are sort of people who really value egalitarianism, um, and but I, I think that um, and more sort of less inequality. But I feel like once you take out a lot of these um, sort of like bottlenecks to you know a purely decentralized internet, that it will create. You know, some version of this term is loaded, but some version of meritocracy and thus it will let certain people excel, you know, w- way beyond their, their capacities right now and way beyond other people who are incapable or unwilling or don't have the right opportunities or, and so it will, this, I sort of see two vectors. I see sort of, uh, you know, software is eating the world and that, that's, I put that into sort of decentralization camp. Um, but then I also see like egalitarianism eating the world. It's sort of like, this two competing forces, which is this desire for more egalitarianism and more, more equality. And, and the vector for that typically is government to sort of try to rearrange the unfair starting points or unfair outcomes. And those, those are effectively the same thing, uh, out- outcome and opportunity, because if there's equal outcome between, uh, unequal outcome between two people, their kids are going to have unequal opportunities. So you can't, you know, uh, dis- like disaggregate opportunity for, from outcome. So I, f- I feel like government is the vector there. And then the internet is is uh, a, a competing vector that's trying to make things more, you know, put markets in everything. I'm curious if that sort of framework even resonates from from you. And I, I think it's I think what we'll continue to see is basically both of them rise. I.e., you know, people become more sovereign, companies get bigger, and governments get get bigger. And it just seems that the internet creates everything into a barbell. Where you know, I started asking the question uh, before this podcast of, you know, if we think about things like money and languages and currencies. Will, do these things get more uh, fragmented over time? Is there a long tail or, or do they get more concentrated over time? And it seems like things on the internet, you know, I think it's the rainforest theory that Ben Thompson has where you just see a bifurcation where you have all these you know, sellers on Shopify more, more than ever, but then you also have Amazon. It seems like that's sort of the trend all, all over. Any any reactions? Yeah. And the, and the meritoc- merit- meritocracy element of it, is, is that because there's a certain element of if you are coming day one, if you're, if you're coming onto the internet, you, and you have a certain amount of cash or a certain amount of power that the internet will just then magnify that power. Is that, is it kind of like, a, like an inequality 
Because I do see that as being somewhat part of it, but I'm not sure if that's what you're... Sort, sort of, yeah. I think basically like frictionless way to create and capture value, you know, uninhibited by sort of artificial gatekeepers, whether it's a, you know, a university that, you, or, you know, regulation or licensing or, or uh, you know, a, a regulation that can cap your, your, your business or journalists that can cap your business. So it's just, it's just the freedom to, to excel to the fullest of one's abilities. And that will just by inherently create inequalities because, you know, people have different abilities and starting points and interests and, and skills. That, that's, that's what I mean when I, when I say meritocratic. Yeah. Well, I think that one really interesting way that this could play out is when we think about whether it's a journalist or an entrepreneur or a node or any, you know, anyone that's kind of being a center for a center for data or, or communications, like, you know, these kind of centers that we're creating around ourselves on the internet, these kind of publication centers, right? I think one thing that, that could be interesting when we talk about power is that I believe there will be a lessening of power from the big platforms because as soon as the data is portable, right. And that I could leave um, and take my data with me. I mean, imagine like as an example, something simple like Airbnb, right. Um, One of the value adds of Airbnb is that their reputation system. I go on, I've rented my place 30 times. I, over the years, build this reputation system. Right now, I can't leave and take that with me, right? So that's stuck in Airbnb. There's a bit of a loss that I would have to incur if I were to go to Verbo or some other new one, right? Maybe it's not big enough, you know, to worry about, but maybe it is. And, you know, maybe if if in the same kind of analogy, maybe we're talking about my medium data or things that I've written, you know what I mean? The, the claps that I've gotten, you know, different kind of scenarios of, of data ownership this could play out. This becomes a little bit dangerous. Um, well, it's just as far as my livelihood. I'm like, oh, I'm kind of stuck on this platform, right? Um, but if we were to improve these protocols and the data portability and be able to take our data with us in this, in this example here, it really lessens the power um, of, let's say, a Mark Zuckerberg, right? Because right now, there's no real benevolence in his dictatorship. Like, he can kind of do whatever he wants. But if there was a situation like we see, let's, for example, with open source code, right? If somebody's running an open source code project and you don't like the person at the top, everyone can just fork it and leave. <laughs> and, go. and and I think that kind of analogy is what we could see Oh yeah, cool. Um, yeah, Facebook's spying on us. Whatever du jour of the day, um, we're just going to fork Facebook, and we're just going to go over here, and we're going to elect somebody else, right? So it's a more democratic way, and and it's been proven out over over the decades from the bottom up code. You know, that's how code is created um, democratically, open source, in a lot of in a lot of cases, not in all cases, but there's quite a lot of projects that represent that, and I, and I think that's the way the projects will go, and that's the way these kind of center hubs um, of power will will capture that power that leaves some of these big, big tech uh, firms. Totally. Chris, for people who want to go deeper on, on this topic and your work and, 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 and stay, uh, stay tuned for as you, as you finish this book and release it, where can you point them? That's a really good question. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Castig. That's C A S T I G. Or you can email me. It's Chris at one month.com. That's O N E M O N T H.com. And yeah, you know, I'm really, I'm working on in the middle of this research. So if there's anyone listening who has someone I should talk to, or you have some ideas, things I should consider doing a lot of interviews and would love to incorporate yeah, I'd love to open source and uh, open source the project in a way, and you know, happy to incorporate um, a variety of different perspectives and voices, and that's really my goal with this. So, yeah, feel free to reach out. Those those would be two pretty great places, and I have a lot of writing online too. I guess you can go to castig.org is my website, it's the same C A S T I G, and you could read. I have a handful of things published around the history of the internet and uh, stuff like that. So check that out. Awesome, Chris. Thank you so much so much for coming to the podcast. It's been a great episode. Yeah, thanks so much, Eric. Thanks for having me. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Check us out at villageglobal.vc.